Sean M. P. W. H. He posted a video titled, More Proof Evolution is Wrong. Now, make no mistake about it, he is a creationist, but I do feel to some extent that he is one of the more rational ones in the sense of he's not going out completely declaring that everything is wrong. In his video, he states things in a question. There's a big difference between saying that, that evolution is wrong because there are no transitional fossils versus saying something like, well, where are these transitional fossils? He tends to do the latter, which is why I'm doing this response. That being said, keep in mind he is a, he is a creationist and he does have fantastic classy videos of the name of Obama tries to provoke his own assassination, Sarah Palin for president, more proof evolution is wrong, and same-sex marriage and the downfall of America. So keep that in mind when we're listening to his claims. I've um, said that we've seen these animals, like the frill shark and the ocean nautilus, and I know there's at least um, one other example, but I forget that they the, the living for millions of years without changing. And um, that's evidence that I'm suggesting um, shows us that change over time doesn't happen. I mean, that's just how I'm interpreting that evidence. To answer your question, some organisms are so well suited to their environments that they simply aren't forced to change. See, the forces which drive evolution and accelerate evolution depend on changes occurring in the environment. Now, if the environment has remained relatively unchanged over the history of the species, we wouldn't expect to see changes in the organism. Think about it this way. If an organism is very well adapted to its environment, then why would it change? Secondly, you're completely ignoring all of the changes that we've seen in the shark lineage as a whole since they first came around. See, the first fish are from Magnatha. These are jawless fish, such as lampreys and hogfish, or and hagfish, rather. Um, here's an example and an illustration showing that evolutionary step, and the, the, that step being the formation of jaws from the, um, the, the, the gill supporting structures. So, as a whole, the Ignathids gave rise to jawed fishes, fishes which, with jaws, such as osteichthys, bony fish, and chondrichthys, or sharks, whose bodies are composed of cartilage. Now, there are also placoderms, lungfish, and things like that, which also descended from Ignatha. However, those simply aren't the topic of this discussion. Okay, so back to chondrichthys, which are sharks. Uh, Cladosalaki arose around 350 million years ago and was the first definitive what's known as elasma branch. Now, elasma branches are a branch of chondrichthys which currently hold sharks, rays, and skates. As such, Cladosalaki would be roughly the first shark. So once the Permian period was ending, the oceans were filled with actinopterygians, which are the ray fin fishes, as you can see here why they're called that. Uh, the environment had changed, and this new food source was readily available, and sharks, under selective pressures, evolved once again. This is known as uh, the Neosalakian radiation. Now, during the early Triassic, a shark appeared which was considered the first modern shark. It's known as Paleospinax, and it's distinct from earlier sharks in that it had a sectioned, calcified vertebral column instead of a continuous notochord. And also, in addition to that one very, very distinct structure, it also had um, supporting leading edge spines on its dorsal fins. And lastly, the mouth had moved from being in the front of the face down to, under to the, underneath the snout like it's found in all sharks today. So finally, the, to bring it all together then, the, the late Cretaceous period gave rise to currently extant sharks, such as horn sharks and cow sharks and many other genera. At the end of the Cretaceous, most shark genera were already established and a catastrophe wiped out dinosaurs and much other life, leaving sharks as pretty much the rulers of the ocean. So with that being said, I've just demonstrated uh, and given you the example of the Neosilikian diversification and explosion that's happened with early sharks. My, my question to you is relatively simple. If, el if evolution is false and life hasn't changed over time, then why do we see this radiation of life in nearly every form of life? Why is every organism not like the frilled shark or the horseshoe crab? See, what you're doing is you're taking the exception to the rule, ignoring the vast majority of life, and applying that exception as if it is the norm, and as if it's seen in all creatures. Life has clearly evolved, and if it hadn't, we would expect to see every animal being unchanged. Shark, radi shark radiation alone, which is your own example, disproves exactly what you're saying. If the predictions are correct, would have resulted in change, and I'm selecting the approximately 120 flightless birds that have gone extinct. Um, you would think that the environmental catalyst would at least allow one of those birds to develop flight. I mean, w and, and we could probably 
see a record of that, we would have, uh, say, the flighted um, dodos and the and the flightless dodos, or it would be the other other way around. We'd have a flightless bird, and then we would find evidence that it had um, gotten the ability to fly. Okay, now I want to address your claim about birds. Well, you need to understand that first of all, birds had the ability to fly, and then they some birds lost it. Now, that's a very good question because flight is such a wonderful thing. So why would these birds who have flight lose the ability to fly? Well, take for example the island of New Zealand, which is where these birds that you're talking about come from. We find no mammals there at all until, well, until man introduced them and until recently. But before that, it was an island completely inhabited by birds, which, by the way, goes against creation because why would we see this unless for evolutionary reasons? Well, first of all, Flight is ridiculously expensive. It costs a lot of energy in order to maintain flight. So if these birds were had the ability to fly, yet didn't necessarily need to, they would be using up a lot of resources and a lot of energy and be less fit than birds who did not need to fly. So that's why, for the most part, birds lost, especially in places like New Zealand, the ability to fly. Birds like the moa, which the um, New, Ze New Zealanders, ancient New Zealanders hunted once they finally got there, are a wonderful example of this. So then you raise the question, well, if evolution is true, why wouldn't they regain the ability to fly? Well, you see, evolution simply doesn't work like that. Um, for one example, and for, for a thorough debunking of exactly what you're saying, take a look at my video, How Evolution Works, The Constraints of Evolution, which I'll link to. Uh, evolution works best as a, a, not necessarily as a sculptor in, in making a brand new creation, but more so going back and refining what is already there. For birds to be able to, to lose the ability of flight, again, you're modifying an existing structure. Um, that's a lot easier to do than instantly having them pop back, you know, wings in full, flo in, um, full form, um, the, the innervation to those wings, the musculature, and all of that that is required of flight. So it's a lot easier to lose than it is for them to gain. Um, now I know that you're going to go back on, well, how did birds evolve the ability to flight to begin with? Well, that happened over a much longer period, and there are other videos on that as well. But in the meantime, I'm going to address your claim as to why they lost the ability to fly. And it's mainly because flight is so damn expensive in terms of energy. So when these hunters came along, why, why didn't they regain the ability to fly? And that's simply because it came along too quickly. There simply was not enough time for them to do so. That and it's difficult to regain lost structures. So in this case, and in the case of the, the flightless birds, many of them went extinct. Although please note that there are plenty of flightless birds still um, around today, such as the ostrich. That's it for part one for right now, guys. Part two will continue next week. Um, please rate, vote, subscribe, and again, make sure that you rate to counteract the effect of the creationist vote bots. Thank you very much for your time, and here it is, your moment of zen. The number one show that dominates cable news, The O'Reilly Factor. Now, in the Netherlands, perhaps the most liberal European country, the government is now shutting down pot shops and legalized brothels. Apparently, organized crime is controlling both over there. It, it hasn't worked in Holland. They had really wonderfully naive ideas about teaching their children to have safe sex and smoke grass. And what's happened is all the criminals and drug addicts throughout Europe have gone and exploited that opening in Amsterdam. It's absolutely run out of control, completely run amok. It's not going to work here. Amsterdam is a mess. My friend is a former Dutch... In the Netherlands, their experimentation with social tolerance, free love, free drugs, clearly has backfired. Amsterdam is a cesspool of corruption, crime. Everything's out of control. It's anarchy. As you point out...